So data mining. Data mining. I just want to make sure that the guys who are like mining, like that they are being treated fairly. <laughs> so why does Google want my data again? So I'm fluent in Python too. I don't know if you knew. Mm -hmm. Like, are we talking like a Monty Python kind of a thing or more of like a parcel tongue? Not parcel tongue, Monty Python. More yeah. yeah. What other snakes do you work with? Anaconda. Oh my God, the Nicki Minaj song. <laughs> and, I love that song. <laughs> One of the foundational ideas in statistics that correlation does not imply causation so just because hello and welcome back to another episode of your friendly neighborhood college counselor where we talk to experts who've walked the talk today we are so thrilled and excited to have dr vivek nandur present with us he is an experienced researcher quantitative economist and has nine years of experience in statistical modeling and a lot of other um boring things <laughs> <laughs> just kidding <laughs> <laughs> Just no, kidding. I get it. I mean, I'm glad that most people find it boring because um, if everybody thought it was interesting, then you wouldn't be special anymore. Exactly. He is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. Welcome, Vivek. How are you? Great to be here. Pleased to have you. So let's begin. I would love for you to tell us a little bit more about your specific area of research. I'm very interested in the U.S. healthcare system. Mm -hmm. And for those who don't really understand it, the U.S. is the only first world country that doesn't have universal health care. Wow. Uh, so you have over 50, 60 million people in the U.S. that are either uninsured or underinsured mm -hmm. and uh, has a whole lot of problems. And then when they do end up going to the hospital for care, uh, they're sort of socked with massive bills that uh, they can't pay yeah. and they get into medical debt. Uh, so there's just this uh, giant inequity in the mm -hmm. US that I find very troubling. Right. Um, and I'm trying to do you know, mm -hmm. with what little I sort of have in this world to try and make a bit of a dent in that. Okay. Interesting. So what drew you to healthcare in the first place? Was there any inciting moment or was it just the sheer crisis of it all? I think definitely COVID um, oh. because I really highlighted things. And in general, you have this problem of politicians claiming that they've done things and that infection rates have gone down and the virus isn't spreading. But the actual truth of the matter is very difficult to, to really detect mm -hmm. uh, in the data. But that's sort of what statistics and data science arms you with ways to sort of suss out what the sort of signal is amongst the noise. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So that was going to be my next question. Like, what role does data science play in public health in particular, especially when there's epidemics, pandemics? No, it's, it, I really see statistics. And when I say statistics, I'm lumping in all of data science and machine learning and AI. I see it as literacy, but for numbers. Because if I just tell you like, oh, pay me one lakh and then I'll make your test scores go up, you can trick a lot of people that way. If you understand causation and things like that, then you can sort of tell when someone's being like a snake oil salesman, mm -hmm. which uh, is often the case. I think you mentioned that already, but like what is the relevance of understanding like the principles of statistics and data science for the lay person, you know, us going about our everyday life, like to what extent is it important? Well, I think at least I can speak uh, from an American's perspective where I think most people thought that people in the government or even the media are generally trying to tell the truth, that their statements are mapping to an objective reality. But I think people realize that that may not be the case. And the only way to really be able to tell what is true and what mm -hmm. is false is by having some a real skeptical hat on. And that sort of thinking is really important in mm -hmm. uh, statistics and data science, because you're sort of constantly trying to disprove your own mind. Yeah. Because our minds are just like pattern seeking mm -hmm. everywhere. We see a few things happen and think, oh, there's a pattern. Right? We understood the world. but. In reality, your mind is playing tricks on you. You're remembering events that are supporting your hypotheses. Oh. It's really not even just a thing about statistics and something that boring. It's interweaving amongst all different aspects of social science that really, uh, I think, gets you the closest to the truth. Wow. That's really interesting. Like using math and numbers to kind of map or predict human behavior, it seems 
almost too good to be true. And what I want to know, is there ever a case in which data fails to capture the complexity of like human decision making or in our pursuit of truth, like where does data fall short? I think it falls short in more deep philosophical Mm -hmm. questions, like questions about the meaning of life and especially things that are individual. Mm -hmm. So like the meaning of life for me is not something that I looked for data on, Mm -hmm. you know? Uh, Well, you might. (laughs) Well, yeah. yeah. It's not something that I would look for answering that question writ large and uh, things of that nature. But there's just so much data in this world. Like we're drowning in data. People don't even know what to do with it. And every single industry is drowning in data right now. You really need somebody to be able to sort of parse through the numbers and find like the gold nuggets in there. Interesting. We have a lot of students in the audience who are looking to get into data science or study this field more. What do you think is the direction this field is taking? What is something young people should anticipate is on the horizon for this discipline? Well, of course, everybody wants to know about AI and is wanting to do things with LLMs. And it is very uh, exciting. But I also caution kind of the world because the problem with these uh, tools is they mimic text extremely well. So if that is the goal of whatever it is you're doing, like creating a cover letter or things of that nature, it's going to do great. But in terms of actually getting deep into the source material and really sort of telling you something nuanced, it can often seem like it's doing that at first blush. And this is like when you're an expert at something and then you query that GBT or Claude or Gemini, you really understand that it does fabricate material at a still a pretty high rate. Oh, um, So I still think that there's such a huge value to math and statistics because they're like the you know, the core of all sciences. Everything is is related through the universal language, which is math. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, I think that's so interesting, right? To understand the foundation of how like a chat GPT works also helps you spot where it's fabricating information. At Athena, we talk a lot about interdisciplinary intersections. And we, at this point, believe that the lines between all disciplines are blurring and intersecting totally. and in, in a beautiful way. So in what ways can statistics or data science influence other fields or in what ways do they overlap? I think of statistics as just literacy. Yeah. So even if you're doing something in psychology mm-hmm. and you're trying to do an experiment on, say, emotion, yeah. you're inevitably going to have to run a statistical test to see whether your treatment actually was different than your control. There's like a minefield of complexity in statistics, but even just at a base level, that's going to touch all sciences and even the social sciences. Right. Can you give me an example like of perhaps a way in which statistics is involved in say finance or economics? Oh, for sure. I mean, in finance, it's all over. Basically, if you look at the stock market, you can think of the stock market as cut up by different sectors. Yeah. The tech sector, the energy sector, finance sector, Mm -hmm. and each of the companies in these sectors, Mm -hmm. their movements are very correlated. And when I say correlated, it just means it moves in the same way. Sure. When I move one company up, the other company also goes up. Mm -hmm. So news that benefits a tech company, say the lowering of interest rates, it'll benefit all the tech companies. Mm -hmm. This is totally my bias. I see economics and statistics as a way of understanding the world because economics is fundamentally about scarcity and decisions. And we all have to make decisions about everything in our lives that are constrained. We have to make trade-offs. All of these things hopefully help us make uh, better decisions. Mm -hmm. And even things like who to marry, you know, can be seen as an economic decision. Mm -hmm. Certainly is. Are there like domains in which statistics are applied that I would be surprised to know? Well, literally every company. Yeah. (laughs) Name me some companies. They all are using statistics to try and chart out future growth opportunities to understand which of their customer base is like more resonant to a certain marketing campaign. I think the place that you might not even know that statistics is really um, sort of taking off is in fields like history. Oh. I think the way history was done, say, 20 years ago and all of before, it was like you had to read these really old books 
and you have to like sit there and read them for like 30 years and then you can kind of talk. <laughs> um, so like a lot of historians, they only like start making their waves once they're like in their 50s. Sure. But now all of these books can and have been digitized. You can use machine learning algorithms to understand the text and the mm. semantics and sort of understand themes like across time in a, in a much quicker wow. and more quantitative fashion. I'm biased in, in saying like, this is to me very exciting, but I'm sure like an old school historian would be like, no, you've got to read the books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if you need to get insights quickly or yeah. find yeah. themes, like you said, yeah. it would take many people, not just one person to try and process all that data. There are unfathomably large swaths of data. How are we storing and managing that as a species? I think everybody has experienced the fact that they've tried to put all these photos and videos on their phone and they're running out of space and it's like, oh my God, which ones should I delete? Okay, I'll delete those. <laughs> Luckily, the cloud has made this a lot easier for us. All of these companies with giant data warehouses allow you to sort of rent space there. And so that's likely going to be the solution though for, for a bit. What are the environmental implications of that? Many of the big tech firms are trying to solve that. That's very much like an open question and there's a lot of research trying to make things more green, but it's tough because the amount of energy required, even for like LLM tokens, yeah. uh, is, is extremely high. A lot of economists take the position that it may like sort of be bad right now, but the capital acceleration mm -hmm. might actually be good uh, later on. It seems like with such rapid developments in this field, the ethical considerations often come after the fact, right? Oh, the ethical implications, say, on the environment or on other people. What are your thoughts on ethics and AI, ML, or data science? I'll broadly say like a lot of this comes to this idea of an externality, mm -hmm. which is, you know, you might be engaging in something and you're getting a sort of benefit or payoff, yeah. but there's somebody else who's being affected. If I was sort of smoking a cigarette right now, that's like the classic example. And for a long time, you could smoke indoors and smoke on airplanes and there were babies around and people didn't realize that there's a massive externality where other people are getting hurt by the secondhand smoke. So just like that, we are now finding a, a lot about the externalities of social media. It's really tough because innovations happening so fast yeah. and researchers like myself, you have to be a bit slow because you have to dot all the I's and cross all the T's and you have to sort of wait for data to even come out. All of these companies have their own novel data that they sort of hoard because of course, Facebook is not going to sort of let out all their Instagram data and be like, oh yeah, Vivek, go analyze this and tell me what's wrong. They don't do right. that. Right. <laughs> it's an ongoing battle. I'd yeah, say. that's really scary. You mentioned that you also research like mental health and that in the landscape of the U.S. What would you say poses the biggest threat to mental health of the young people? Would you say that it is social media or the dopamine influx that all of us are getting on a daily basis? It seems to be uh, social media. It's there in so many different data sources. And even if you just ask Gen Z, mm -hmm. do you like your sort of phone use and social media use? The answer is often no. Mm -hmm. But the problem is they can't stop using it because they feel like massive FOMO. So mm. there was a, a great sort of study that was done, which was like asked people, okay, how much do you value going on TikTok? And uh, the value was like $50 a month. But then they said, okay, well, what if everybody could go off? Mm -hmm. You know, now what's the value? And it was like the reverse. Right. So people like literally don't value it, the product, but the fact that it's part of the conversation and they like sort of feel compelled to. Mm -hmm. It's like a sort of prisoner's dilemma yeah. of uh, a bad equilibrium. Yeah. I think it gets at something much deeper in our evolutionary psychology about wanting to feel connected to our tribe and to our community, right? Like social media creates that illusion of connection and camaraderie and belonging. We're almost creating this like false sense of, of community through these platforms, but are isolating us even further. Absolutely. I think uh, social media was probably the first time in human history where our social currency yeah. uh, could be quantified. Right. And you could not only quantify it, but look at it every minute of the day. Because truly, like, 
we're not supposed to be able to n- know what everybody thinks about us at all times. We're not supposed to be so acquainted with all our in- flaws and our insecurities, like mm-hmm. presented, bombarded, and being compared constantly with other people. Imagine that there is a, a student who's interested in data science and excited about the future of this field. I'm sitting in high school right now. Is there anything they can do to start dipping their toes and getting their hands dirty with the data now? Or do they need to wait until college or beyond to start researching? They can absolutely start right now. But the the sort of difficulty is it's a bit hard to go into this field without any like mentorship, right? Because you're kind of needing some direction, some steering, no matter sort of which phase you're in, whether you're an undergrad or grad student or beyond, you're kind of part of this system. And like there are people who know a lot more than you, at least getting a grasp of the fundamentals of statistics. Um, is is something that I think anyone can do with an internet connection. Mm. Uh, I really think everybody can understand statistics. It's all about ideas and just trying to figure out the truth. Um, And I think most people are interested in that. Of course, of course. Is there any art involved in social science? For sure. A lot of math and statistics is art because the end product seems like a very mathy statistical test. But how you go about doing that is a very sort of artistic process. Like, how do you understand how to like match two people in terms of compatibility? A lot of it is not obvious and isn't like a plug and chug uh, equation. Yeah. Um, I think that's what distinguishes like humans from machines still to that day. Like our ability to wield creativity, challenge existing patterns and and preconceptions and so forth. We have so many students who want to get into research, who want to be scholars, who feel destined, as you did, to become a professor. I would love for you to talk a little bit about that decision you made to enter academia and commit to that lifestyle. Also, what that's been like for you. I think a lot of it depends on, are you the kind of person who likes to do things by yourself? Mm -hmm. Or do you like working with a team? Are you the kind of person who wants to like sort of set your own schedule? Or do you like, like, would you rather like have a boss that you're sort of interacting with on a more hands on uh, basis? Basically, your answers to those would tell me a lot whether you're sort of suited in terms of personality for like academic life. Got it. Um, Nowadays, in many companies, there are huge research teams at like Google and Meta, but even smaller companies have research scientists and especially, of course, a data scientist is like the modern version of that. Mm -hmm. Um, So how did you decide that this was the right field for you? I guess I just have such a high value on truth, on scientific truth that for me working towards that is to be on like the frontier of knowledge yeah and to know that you're like sort of using the most sophisticated methods you're accessing data that nobody else has accessed and uh, trying to inform policy uh prescriptions and conversations like all the way into the White House. Uh, That's exciting. Yeah. So you went to undergrad in the States, in Florida. I think you did your master's there as well. And then you did your PhD in Canada. So a lot of our students are discovering whether the US is the right place to study or Canada. So can you speak to the differences in terms of approaches, curricula, as well as broader culture regionally? The US is, of course, a massive country where you have states like New York, and then states like Texas, the vibe of those states is very different. If you're the kind of kid who has a, a, a few different options and is trying to evaluate where to live uh, in the states and you've never lived there, I would really try and talk to people about the vibe. Um, and what I mean by that is like, for example, like how easy is it to get reproductive rights? Mm-hmm. That's like a, a big uh, conversation in the US right now. And of course, that correlates with many other things. And again, that yeah. word just means if it's a place that is more open to a women's right to choose, that'll also be likely a place that's more progressive in other domains. Exactly. I think that it really impacts like Quality students, yeah. Uh, yeah, like mental health and just a baseline. Like I'm not even talking about university, just like existing. <laughs> just quality of life, yeah. sense of well-being, sense of safety. Yeah. Yeah. And Canada has basically taken a lot of the good things about the US and then left 
a lot of the bad things. So they saw what was going on with the U.S. healthcare system, and they're like, no, 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 we're not going to do that. <laughs> we're we're going to give everybody healthcare. Yeah. They have a completely different stance on guns. It's very difficult to get a gun. I mean, you can get them, but guns for like sporting, and you have to get a license, and it's all registered. And then there's the obvious things about like the weather. If you're somebody who literally can't stand cold at all, then of course. Yeah. And there's some arguments to when you're in the cold, that's like you have nothing to do but study. <laughs> Maybe that's good. Yeah. What about at the academic level? Did you notice any differences? I mean, obviously, you went to different universities. There would be yeah, differences. Yeah, yeah. I think I went to a, a lot of different range of universities. Yeah. Like at the University of Florida. I honestly don't know how I like got a degree, so <gasps> definitely don't follow what I did. Uh, oh, because I like never went to class and oh. I just kind of showed up for like the exams. So the University of Toronto is like a completely different level, super intense, and like mm. they, they call it U of T, but they often refer to it as U of Tears um, because of oh, no. <laughs> yeah, the University of Toronto doesn't have grade inflation problem that oh. a lot of the Ivy League schools have. So in, right. in Harvard, seventy-five to eighty percent of students get A's. Yeah. But at the University of Toronto, it's like 10%. Wow. So there's like an actual bell curve. Bell curve. But I kind of like that. Of uh, course. Yeah. So many students go to college, especially abroad, because they are seeking that level of rigor that they may not have gotten here. Or they want to be challenged. They want to be stimulated intellectually, right? So if you're really right. committing to traveling all the way, paying all this money, getting your money's worth out of the mind-expanding experience that is going to college. Yeah, I would, I would say there's another dimension that uh -huh. uh, is worth thinking about. And that is like the actual city location. Yeah. So if you compare Cornell uh, to NYU, so mm -hmm. these are both, I would say, incredible schools. But Cornell is in Ithaca, which is kind of like in the middle of New York State. And there's not really a lot around there. It's very much like that, like university vibe mm. across the town. Campus setting. Yeah. yeah. But NYU is in New York City. In New York City, it's like its own country. I couldn't think of like a more polarizing experience. And they're like three hours away. Yeah. So again, a lot of this depends on like the person. I gotcha. I really feel like in the States, often the hardest part of going to college is getting into college. I, that was my experience too. Like I felt like high school was very challenging. Last two years of high school, we did the IB slog to, you know, get a good SAT. Getting into Michigan was like a high point. Yeah. And then my first year was like genuinely easier than my last year in high school. I think grade inflation is pervasive, I would say. It's pretty easy to like get good grades, I guess. Definitely in the, the first year, yeah. for sure. Thank you, Dr. Nandur, for joining us. It was a true pleasure. Of course. Anytime. We learned a lot. Thank you so much for watching another episode of Your Friendly Neighborhood College Counselor. If this episode interested you, please do be sure to like this video, share it with any of your other friends who are looking to get into data science, and subscribe for more interesting and captivating content all about college, academia, and various disciplines and the directions that they're taking. See you next time.